Welcome to Communicast, a communication skills podcast. I'm Scott D'Amico, president of Communispond. On today's episode, I'm chatting with Marcus Schaller, senior content director for Team 201, a leading digital marketing agency. Marcus shares how focusing on being present and meditation have helped him improve his communication skills and stresses the importance of not letting your enthusiasm get the best of you when it comes to being an effective listener. I hope you enjoy. Marcus, thank you so much for joining me today. If you can, to get us kicked off, maybe tell the listeners a little bit about yourself, your background, and the work that you're doing today. Thank you, Scott. I'm so happy to be here with you today. Um, My name is Marcus Schaller. I am the Senior Content Director at Team 201, and we're a digital marketing agency that helps high-growth B2B tech companies uh, scale up their marketing program for the next stage of their growth. My background is pretty much in in, uh, freelance uh, content marketing, SaaS technology marketing, and uh, I've been doing that for for almost 18 years on and off with different types of companies. And uh, now I'm really excited. I've, I've just recently started this role with Team 201, and uh, it's a very exciting time for me. So I'm, I'm glad to be able to share a little bit of my insights with you today. Excellent. Thank you for sharing, and congratulations on the new role with Team 201. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, so as I would think in, in the marketing space, you know, from, from my perspective, what I always envision of when, when you're working with marketing, lots of creative people, mm. probably lots of people that are great at casting the vision out there, really inspiring people with the message. So if you think about your career, not only from, from a content perspective, you're doing the freelance work, and now as a content director with this new organization, when you hear that somebody is a great communicator or they have very strong communication skills, what does that mean to you? That's a great question. Um, I think the first thing that pops into my head is that they're an extraordinarily good listener. You know, communication, uh, it's, a, it's an active kind of word, right? We think about it as something we're doing, but I think a lot of it is also what we're expressing, right? So, uh, you know, when we're, when we're, speaking with a client or a coworker, you know, are we actually present with them? Are we actually hearing them? Because we could be eloquent, we could be well-spoken, right? We can have all the best ideas in the world, but if we don't really truly understand what they're saying is the best possible way, then we're going to miss the mark, right? So I think the people that I've respected uh, the most have been the ones that I can just tell when I'm, when I'm engaged with them that they're just 100% there. I just think that's such an important, there was one skill, I would say, like one meta skill, I would say that would be it. So when it comes to listening, and I wholeheartedly agree with you, and that's come up a number of times in my conversation, just even quite honestly, throughout my career, if I think about some of the people who are strong communicators, they really do listen. You know, from your side, how, how, how do you develop that skill? When you think about mm-hmm. listening as a skill, what are some ways that you really, you know, train yourself to make sure that you're you're listening to understand and not listening just to respond that's great yeah and and i'll start out with saying that i can always get better so whatever i have learned i'm not thinking that i've i've reached it yet but for me personally um i think that in in the past i have not been so strong in that area um years ago i think i was much more driven by by things like proving myself or being the smartest person in the room or you know i'm an idea guy right i like to have ideas and you want to express them and that enthusiasm would get that the better of me um and over the last five six seven years i've uh i think the thing that's made the biggest difference for me is my own uh, meditation practice and i know meditation is kind of like a buzzword right now but it really has had an extraordinary uh impact on I mean, so many, every area of my life, honestly, but when it comes to communication, um, my ability to be able just to, again, be present, to be focused on the person I'm talking to, to not necessarily be driven by, this is the thing we all see all the time, right? You know, people wait for their turn to speak, right? They're not necessarily listening to the other person. They're just waiting for the other person to shut up so they can actually get their idea in, right? So it turns into like, instead of a conversation, it's more like trading off monologues, right? So I think that practice of, of actually, you can call it mindfulness, whatever you want to call it, of being able just to, to quiet that a little bit and just be, be present with somebody and, and be able just 
to have the curiosity to actually want to hear what they're saying, right? Because yeah. when it's no longer so much about you and your ego and your selfishness and whatever, you know, uh, you know, it's it's much easier than to be far far more interested in other people and what they have to say. But again, it's a work in progress. So you know, there's always room for improvement. <laughs> Absolutely. No, I mean, I think anything that any type of skill you constantly have to work at, it's like a muscle, right? If you don't mm -hmm. exercise, it's going to atrophy and go away. It's fascinating that you bring up you know, the idea of meditation. I never really thought about that before that, you know, with, with meditation, really just kind of clearing everything else out, right? Mm -hmm. Just kind of clearing out all the noise. And if you think about a conversation or a dialogue, the importance of that, so that forget about what's going on at home, forget about the thousands of things to do on your to-do list or the emails piling up or other phone calls coming in really just lock in mm. on that one thing and i think as you do that it's going to lead more so to that curiosity you're going to hear things that's going to pique you additional questions in your brain to kind of follow up with that person and you just kind of mentioned before the idea of you know people just kind of coming back 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 with more ideas and i would imagine in the marketing space with lots of creative folks you do run into that there's there's so many great ideas people wanting to get their idea out there and it all, quite honestly made me think of my kids right whenever mm -hmm. you're trying to have a conversation with them or they're talking with one of their friends it's just constantly me boop boop no one uh -huh. can finish a, a thought before the other person is jumping in right they're not listening they're just waiting for their turn to get out there and talk and i, you know, I think back there's just, there's one person that i've worked with throughout my career who was a phenomenal communicator. One of the things was, is that when you were talking with him, you felt that you were the most important person in his world right then. And one of the great things that he did was whenever you were, you'd say something, he would pause. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, especially if you're on the phone, it was an, felt like an uncomfortably long pause. It might've only been a second and a half or two seconds. Yeah, We're really not used to that, right? We're yeah. used to, we're done and then boom, somebody jumps right in with their response. But what he was doing, one, he was processing what, mm -hmm. what he had just heard, but also he was signaling to me or whoever he was talking to that he was listening. He wasn't just waiting to jump in and give his response. He was thinking about it and typically would come back with a very thoughtful response. So yeah, I, I love the idea of mindfulness, meditation, really using skills from other parts of your life to see how do they translate into the workplace. That's awesome. Yeah, and, and think about I love your point about the pause too, because that's a, a very tactical part that I am still working on because my enthusiasm does get the best of me sometimes. But uh, to your point about the type of people um, who who have been known to, you know, they, they, when you're talking to them, you feel like the only person in the room or in the world or whatever, right? So there's a really nice uh, side benefit to this, where when you think about communication, I, I think of it in terms not just of specific skills in the sense of you know how we word our ideas or or our tone of voice things like that which are very important i also think of it in terms of what are what are the the friction points what's the bottleneck that gets in the way right and mm -hmm. so one of the the big ones is the does your counterpart whether it's on email or zoom or whatever and face to face whatever that felt like whatever face to face was back in the day um do they feel like they're seen? Do they feel like you're actually there present with them? And I think when I, when I think about the impact that that kind of skill has had on my life and my career, my personal life, um, you know, just, just the, the ability just to calm down and just to, with my, my body language, with my demeanor, with what I say or don't say, to really communicate that non-verbally to the person that they, that I'm actually there, right? That they're seen. If you think about what most people really want in life, they just want to be seen, right? Mm -hmm. So it's the great. It's one of the greatest uh, ways to show people respect. And by doing that, you're you open up a level of trust, a level of cooperation, a level yeah. of collaboration that might not otherwise have existed. And that's where the real fun stuff happens. Then, right? Absolutely. And, and if I think of from, from a personal standpoint, I know, you know, working from home, you know, when I get done with work, you know, I come out of the office, my kids are there and they're wanting to, you know, tell me about their day and all this, mm -hmm. what they saw on TikTok, all these, these crazy things. And, you know, a lot of times I'm coming down, I might still be checking my, my email or, or wrapping up a call, or whatever. And, you know, I've found when 
when they when they, they come to me, they want to share all this stuff is I try to click the phone, put it down, turn mm -hmm. myself to where they are. And I could just see the reaction that it gets from them that they like that. Like you mentioned, people want to be seen, they want to felt like they're being heard. And you know, I try to bring that into the workplace where when uh, I'm in a one on one, whether it was back in the day when they were face to face, kind of phone off, put away, locking mm -hmm. in on that person, or you know, during a you know, a phone call, shutting down outlook, not paying attention to the text messages that are popping in, really kind of showing the respect to that person that you know, I'm here, I'm, I'm focused on you. So no, that's great. So Marcus, as you kind of think about your career, I know you spent a lot of time uh, you know, doing freelance work as an entrepreneur now kind of moved into this new role. If you think about, you know, maybe the differences or similarities between the two, what skills are you seeing that are most relevant today? And I think specifically kind of in that, that content, that marketing area that you play in. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I think there's two, two sides to this that I, that I think are really relevant to my new situation. Um, what is internally, right? Because I'm now part of this really amazing team, and we're, we're we're a collaborative team. It's it's an it's a collaborative effort, right? Collaborative. It's it's not just about any one person. And um, I think back to maybe times in my past, maybe ten years ago, ahead of you know before that, that you know maybe my approach to communication wouldn't have been as effective. And again, I was learning, right? But yep. um, but, uh, you know, when you think about what we're trying to do, you know, the, the, the level of our quality of our work is really only as good as the quality of our communication as a team, right? So, and that involves respect, that involves our relationship with each other and, and trust and, and psychological safety and all these different things. Um, so that's really important, especially when you're talking about an environment where feedback is kind of a day-to-day -day occurrence, right? There's always an iterative process. It's not just one person writing something and then it goes out. It's a, it's a group effort. So the ability to, to take feedback with the right intention and to give feedback with the right intention, right, uh, is so important because uh, any one of those points, I mean, you think about feedback is really one of the big triggers for people, right? Critical free feedback is, is tough for a lot of people because it's, it feels threatening. It makes us feel vulnerable. And so that's one of those things that can kind of create again, that kind of bottleneck, right? Or that, that friction. And on the flip side, when I think about the, the client facing communications, which is something I'm much more used to as a freelancer, having worked directly with clients, I think, you know, within the context of, of Team 201, what I see is, you know, the, the sophistication of the conversation, the level of sophistication of that, because we're talking about now um, collaborating with the client where we're not just talking about creative output and, and you know, writing content, things like that. We're talking about understanding analytics, understanding the data behind it, being able to communicate how that data influences uh, the, their marketing's impact on revenue and all those. So you're talking about not only being able to express these kind of uh, technical details in a way that's relevant to the client and be able to communicate that so they can understand how it fits into their strategy, but also do it in a way where it accounts for the fact that they have their own internal team, right? So they have stakeholders in different departments, sales, marketing, customer success, whatever it is, and then the C-level people as well. So that dance, right, of being able to take all those moving parts into account so that I think the main difference between those two is really the context, right? So the context of an internal kind of team collaboration and the way we communicate versus the context of when we actually engage with the client as also a partner, as also part of our team in a way, because we're, right. we're an extension of their team to some extent. Absolutely, and I, I would think there's, there's probably a lot of folks out there that if they haven't really focused on honing those communication skills throughout their career, making the transition into a team, like an, an inside team within an organization can be challenging. You know, I think of you know my experiencing moving from a very large organization to a very small organization, just the, the difference in dynamics there, being able to adapt and change communication styles, things like that. But and then also the other way around, you know, going from where maybe you're used to just working directly with your clients and not having you know that team around you where you're having to to get the feedback, ask for the feedback, provide feedback, 
uh, and really understanding the dynamics of a team that you may be stepping into. Mm. So you know, having those skills that you've worked on throughout your career, you know, listening, understanding, focusing in on people, really questioning, I think helps to make that transition. And one of the things you hit on is something that we hear at Communispond on a regular basis is data. Mm. Right? Data is king nowadays. And, you know, everything revolves around that. You know, everything that you do in life is just feeding data to someone somewhere, right? And you know, we hear a lot from our clients that they have really strong data analytics people. They're great at you know coming up with all these programs. I'm not going to pretend like I understand that one bit. <laughs> um, but you know, where they see the gap is, you know, how can they take that data and help bring it to life for somebody maybe like me that doesn't fully understand all of that? So this idea of you know taking complex information, making it relatable to other people. You know, as you've been working with this team, what are you seeing? You know, maybe some of your, like you mentioned earlier, the, the leaders of the company, or as you're going in and talking to some of these clients, how are they doing that to try and frame that conversation? Well, that that's a great question. And I am actually, I'm so relatively new to this team that I, I have not unfortunately had as much behind the scenes access to those direct conversations. Um, what I can say though, overall, when you're talking about being able to communicate, uh, you know, that kind of data-driven story is really story, right? Is understanding that again, there's a context to things, right? So I think data is fantastic, it's critical, uh, but it can also be misused as a crutch, right? Where we can look at data and we can, we can not necessarily look at it in a way that drives uh, a, a, the decision or drives a, a higher level view of what's going on, but we, yeah. we use it simply as a metric to justify maybe actions that aren't that effective, right? So one example that comes up is in the marketing world, there's, there's always this kind of debate over the, you know, marketing qualified leads, you know, when you do an ebook and, and, you know, now somebody downloads it and, you know, it gets sent off to sales, right? And mm -hmm. sales is going, this isn't, you know, this isn't really quality. They're not, right. they just wanted to read an ebook. That's just one example that pops up, but you know that's a driven that's driven by a metric called you know we want to get X number of MQLs you know and mm -hmm. so you know when we're only driven by the metrics or the data that can that can lead us astray. Mm -hmm. I think where where it comes down to um, communicating that with the client is to be able to frame it in some kind of story. Uh, there's a, a relatively new book called Everyday uh, Story Business, excuse me, Everyday Business Storytelling that I absolutely love because they put it in a framework where um, it's it's done from this very simple narrative framework where we look at it and it's like you know you start out with there's characters, there's a setting, there's a conflict, kind of sets the table for it, right? Hmm. Like why do we care? Do we relate to this? Can we understand the context of this? And then there's like this big idea, right? Like the big idea is what bridges that conflict or that trouble, that problem to whatever the solution is. And the last part is the how, right? So this is how we're gonna solve it. This is this is how we're gonna fix this problem. I think it's really useful to think about that and they make really good specific examples in that book about how to incorporate data into that. Because if you can use data as a way to enhance and strengthen the narrative, then it's really powerful, right? But if you just throw at people, you know, infographics used to be like a really big thing, you know, you know it's just like, here's some data, like all these kind of disparate <laughs> kind of data points of, you know, 17% of people drink coffee, like, okay, cool, whatever. <laughs> like, what it didn't seem, to... yeah, it didn't really have context to it. So I think taking the data and making sure that it fits somehow within a narrative and, and strengthens at the point that you're trying to make and makes it more relevant to the person that you're trying or the audience that you're trying to influence. Absolutely. And I think, you know, throughout most of our careers, we've probably encountered someone like that, that is just a master storyteller. Mm. They could take something complex or they could take data that may not seem relevant or seem obscure and really paint it in the light of here's why we need to think about this or here's why mm. we need to think about this differently, maybe they pull in, you know, a story from their life that seems unrelated, but they're somehow able to bring it back together. And, you know, that's, that's where the magic happens, right? That's what's going to, you know, bring that data to life and really make it meaningful. And, and I appreciate the recommendation on, on the book. I'll definitely have to check that out. So, you know, if you kind of think to, to your career, right, you know, over time, you know, what's one or two skills that you've had that, you know, have helped you kind of sustain 
right? Your, your business on your own. And then now I think make the leap into, you know, this new opportunity. Well, I don't know if it can be called a skill. I know that um, building my network, I guess that may be a skill, yeah, absolutely. right? That's and, a skill. and that's had a massive impact. Um, I, I think if I were, other than, other than my enthusiasm that would uh, make me, you know, not necessarily be a good listener in the past, but <laughs> I think, uh, you know, prior to the pandemic, you know, the beginning of 2020, uh, if I were to look at one real weakness in my game, I would think, you know, my network, right? You know, I just mm -hmm. really, maybe it was just a result of being self-employed, I don't know. But I wasn't very good at at really building those relationships and, and maintaining them. Um, and I think part of it was because of a misconception about what networking meant. You know, I, I kind of come from the old school background of, I remember still going to chambers of commerce functions and people are just essentially passing each other business cards right. and still trying to sell each other stuff. And so I just always had kind of a bad taste in my mouth from that. But, you know, when the pandemic hit, like a lot of people, uh, you know, we, we shut down and then, you know, LinkedIn was kind of the refuge. And I had started a podcast at the same time. And, and through that, I just started building some really amazing uh, business friendships or whatever you want to mm -hmm. call them. And, uh, you know, those led to a lot of the opportunities. Those, I, I believe that really directly led to my position now with Team 201, right? So I think that skill of, it, it relates to communication, right? It relates to listening is, is the skill of building a network and building those relationships in a way that comes from as much as possible from, what can I give in this situation? How can I create value? And not in a cliche way, not in a strategic way, not so mm -hmm. that I can get something, but really just feeding into it. And just kind of knowing, just having faith that, you know, yeah, if I do that, other things will happen. I don't have to think about it or, or do the math on, am I getting it back? Right. You know? So I'd say, you know, for, especially for people uh, earlier in their career, you know, I've, I've, I've met a lot of people in their, you know, twenties, it's just maybe it's their first marketing role or sales role. And when it's come up, that's really been the one thing I've, I've expressed is like, start, keep building that, keep investing in those relationships because we have these tools like LinkedIn. I didn't, LinkedIn 10 years ago was, you know, almost useless, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was nothing like it is today. So there's such a, such a great opportunity to be able to build that. A absolutely. Yeah. Big, big fan of, of LinkedIn and the, the value that it can bring. And I, I love what you mentioned about you know, building the network and, you know, adding value and really doing it without an eye on what am I going to get out of this, right? What's my immediate mm -hmm. ROI? You know, I'm a big believer of you just, just continue to, you know, put good stuff out there and eventually it's going to come back, right? And you talk about LinkedIn and building your network. It's, it's different than just, you know, invite, 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 you know, having 10,000 people on a LinkedIn network really doesn't do you any good if 99% of them don't know who you are, wouldn't you know, take a message from you or respond to a message. So it is using that tool in a very thoughtful way, as you mentioned, to bring value to people, to share resources, you know, give them opportunities to showcase what they're doing. You had mentioned you had, you had started a podcast and you've done a number uh, of those throughout the years. And I think a lot of the work that you've done has led to the success, you know, the work that you're doing now, the work that you've done in the past, more opportunities, you know, coming out. Mm. And you know, just from, you know, from my perspective, having the opportunity to, you know, be on your, your podcast and share my thoughts, you know, meant a lot to me, you know, as I'm getting this up and running now, I was excited to kind of invite you to come on and share your thoughts, your expertise. So it is, it's, it kind of comes around, but it's this idea of how do you build that network mm. in a thoughtful way, right? networking really with a purpose and not networking for the sake of saying, you know, I have all these people on my, my LinkedIn network, but really doesn't do much good, right? If they don't respond to you, if they don't engage with the content or see value from the content that you're putting out there. And I see that a lot on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of side hustle talk and there's a lot of crushing it talk and there's a lot of, you know, um, you know, I reached 10,000 followers, you know, and that's fine. I mean, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. I, you know, I'd love to have 10,000 people following right. me. Um, the thing that I just, I, I, I feel sometimes can be misleading about that is that when we think about, at least for myself, when I think about the relationships that I've had the most impact on positive impact of people that I've been able to help 
in some way, right? And and vice versa, people that have really referred me to a situation or, or, or you know, recommended me for an opportunity, right? It wasn't because they were following me and I never heard of them, right? It wasn't because they were like, you know, I had, you know, at any time, 150 likes on any of my posts and 50, right. you know, whatever, you know, it just wasn't, it wasn't about that. It was, it was uh, something that came from, I, I believe, a much more kind of one-to-one -one personal kind of um, approach to it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not going to say that building the audience strategy, like building the larger audiences is, is necessarily wrong or bad. It's, it's just a different take. I think mm -hmm. where it can, where it can be a, a kind of a challenge for people is when they make that again, speaking of data and metrics, when they make that the primary metric, right? When they think yeah. I put out a post and I only had 17 likes and 14 comments. It's like, Oh, so I, therefore I failed. It's like, right. wait a minute. Did you act? You, you, if you kind of reframe that, you had 14 comments or 14 people that engaged with you and want mm -hmm. to have a conversation. Like, that's a huge win. Yeah. In 1998, I can't have imagined <laughs> having that opportunity, right? right? So I, I think framing that and kind of being clear about, you know, that the quality of these relationships, which goes to the quality of communication, is really something that comes from thoughtfulness. It comes from yeah taking time to actually engage with people in, in a real way. And, yep. and yeah, we all want to succeed in our, in our careers. You're not, you know, but, but that, that comes after, right. It's like, that's, you put into it first and uh, you might be really surprised over time. What comes back. I have been, yeah. I've been shocked as what's come back, you know, same here. No, it is. You, you invest, you make those deposits and eventually it is, it is going to come back. And for me, it's something that I've really been, focusing on is, you know, have, having built you know, a strong network of people that, you know, that I trust and respect. And I, and I feel that it's, it's reciprocal, not just investing in that network when I need it or when mm -hmm. I need something, right? Yeah. Maybe if I'm looking yeah. for a new job, right? I'm, I'm trying to secure a deal, but really continuing all throughout the year, every year, investing in that network, picking up the phone, calling somebody that I've worked with, you know, five years ago, staying in touch with them, uh, it just, you know, it shows that, like I said, you really are doing it out of a, a genuine place. And I think people appreciate that authenticity, that it's not, oh, I'm hearing from Scott again, and he must need something, right? Mm. Uh, so just, you know, continue to nurture those relationships. And it loops, loops back to what I was talking at the beginning of our conversation, mentioning about my own kind of approach to, you know, learning mindfulness or whatever, and and kind of separating from what what had been driving me, which is proving myself and ego and, you know, whatever it is, just like this, these things are, you know, this is called self-interest, right? You know, and uh, I think that might have been a real stumbling block because I wanted to approach networking from an authentic place. I, you know, I, I always wanted to be authentic, right? I never wanted to be like a fake person. Right. But when I was still kind of obsessed with, well, what's it going to result in? You know, what am, how am I going to know, whatever? then doing it from an doing it in a way that was coming from a place of giving felt like I wasn't really doing it for that reason. I mm -hmm. felt like I, I still had that ulterior motive, yeah. right? I just thought I was so much above it, which is nonsense. But, uh, but you know, again, that shift for me personally, where it became much uh, more natural and real for me just to be like, oh, no, I'm not driven by that. It just wasn't a thing that was motivating me, which I think the, the way I, I, I interact with people hopefully is reflected in that coming from, I'm not thinking how to do it. It's just kind of a much more natural approach. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, throughout the conversation, you, you've talked a lot about really continuing to learn, continuing mm -hmm. to develop these skills, right? It's just so important that you've felt that maybe seven, eight, nine years ago, you weren't there, you, you continued work in progress. You, who has been someone throughout your career, and you don't need a name, you know, specific name, but you know, who's been someone throughout your career that, that you've really learned from with mm. regards to becoming a better communicator? What, you, what did you take from that? Yeah, so I, I, the one person I can think of is from way back in the day, and obviously people still know now, but uh, Richard Branson is a lot of people's mm. hero, I think. But um, when I was in my early 20s, uh, he had written his first autobiography. And, and it just, 
you know, for anybody that's listening that's not too familiar, you know, Richard Branson was like, you know, this kind of 60s hippie anti-corporate dude, which I could really relate to in my 20s, right? <laughs> and uh, here he was, he started this, the, you know, the Virgin Records and, and all these different types of things. And I'd always had this kind of entrepreneurial bug, right? So here was the first person that I can remember in my life that actually I could relate to as an entrepreneur, right? This is kind of before Steve Jobs became Steve Jobs, the one that we all idolize, mm -hmm. right? It was way before the iPhone and all that stuff. But so um, long story short, uh, the reason it comes up to communication is because we go back to that thing about authenticity. I don't know Richard Branson. I don't know if he's authentic or not, but you know, from what I like to uh, glean from him as a person is that he, he operates from a, from a source of kind of joy. He loves what he does. He cares deeply about his companies. I hope he cares about his employees. Um, he cares very much about getting into outer space, you know, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah. So, so when I think about somebody who might, have, who might have been a role model for me in that, I think that I could do a lot worse than him. Uh, absolutely. And so the, the thing that I would think when I think of him is there seems to be a match between his words and his actions. Mm, there's some, and yeah, there's an integrity. A, absolutely. And that, that mm -hmm. leads to integrity and trust and respect. And oftentimes there, you know, people will have maybe a mismatch between their words and their actions, right? They're doing something and they're saying something else. But when, you, when you're out there and putting out there who you are, what you're all about, and then you're backing it up with your actions, whether it's how you run your businesses, treat your employees, things like that, uh, live your life, so to speak. I think that's what's what's going to resonate with people. And, mm -hmm. and it's a core part of, of communication. It doesn't really matter what you say, because if you're not doing it on the back end, it's, it's going to fall flat. People aren't going to believe you moving forward. So no, that, that's an interesting take on that. I appreciate that. Yeah. And, Mark, and think, yeah. sorry, I, I just was going to add something real quick to that. If you think about what the, what's the purpose of communication, right? Mm -hmm. In, in a business context, it's we can we can achieve some kind of goal. We can do you know create some kind of uh, work together. Whatever it is, there's mm -hmm. there's a there's an an end goal to it, right? And the core ingredient to that is trust, right? I mean, if you're trying to, especially a complex project, or you're trying to you know revamp a marketing campaign, whatever it is, if people don't trust each other, then everything falls apart. Right. Because yep. not only are they not hearing you, they don't feel seen, but now what happens when there is a little bit of conflict, which is part of communication, right. which is part of working in a team or working with clients. Um, you know, there's going to be parts where maybe one person sees it differently. The trust is really that foundation. So I, I, I think in the, in the relationships I have had in business, it's really about the best I can hope to be myself is somebody that somebody looks at other people look at and feel like, Yes, if nothing else, Marcus is somebody that we trust. He, you know, might make a mistake or whatever, but he's not coming from a place of out of integrity. Absolutely. I think that's a, a I was going to ask you for a closing thought. I think you hit it right there. <laughs> Your trust is foundational to effective communication. And it ties back to what we just hit on this idea of creating that match between what you say and what you do. Mm. Doing what you say you're going to do is going to build that trust for people and I think helps communication move forward a lot quicker. Mm -hmm. And I think it helps you to rebound from something. You may make a mistake, you may, you know, goof on something, but there is always going to be that foundational level of trust. So Marcus, thank you so much for taking the time to, to chat with me today. I really do appreciate it. And I hope you have the great rest of your day. Thank you. I had a blast. Hope to talk to you again soon. Awesome. Take care. Thank you again to my guest, Marcus Schaller from Team 201. As you are working on your communication skills, focus on creating that alignment between what you say and what you do in order to build trust. And remember that it is okay, as Marcus put it, to be a work in progress. Being an effective communicator is not a static thing. It takes lots of practice and continuous refinement. I hope you enjoyed this episode and please be sure to subscribe to Communicast to be notified of new episodes. Thanks and have a great day.